Thank you. And by the way, in the Ardeshna study, there was no benefit in panel four of rituximab in delaying time to progression. So, anyhow, um, single agent rituximab or biological doublets in frontline treatment of indolent lymphoma. This is what you get with chemotherapy. When you're using bendamustine versus RCHOP, you can see that, yes, you get higher response rates, but the curves for progression-free survival continue to go down, continue to go down. And if you look at the toxicity of chemotherapy, yes, it's only six months initially, but patients continue to be toxic from their chemotherapy. Let's just look at grades three and four. Almost 40% leukocytopenia, 30% neutropenia. Uh, some have anemia, some have thromocytopenia. But what they worry about are the paresthesias from both of these regimens, mostly RCHOP, stomatitis, rashes, allergic reactions, 40, 50% of patients having infections and sepsis. That's the German study. In the BRIGHT study, or the not so BRIGHT study, which was a comparison of RCHOP or RCVP versus RBENDA, once again, if you look at the toxicities, grade three or worse, 30, 40, 50, 72% have neutropenia. Uh, some have anemia, uh, nausea in a couple of patients, vomiting in some patients, abdominal pain, rashes, uh, infections and whatever. So there is toxicity associated with this chemotherapy. Now the first regimen to suggest that we might be able to get away without chemotherapy was the SAC from Gilmini, which was rituximab four weekly doses and then maintenance every other month times four, so not prolonged maintenance with its potential adverse complications versus observation. And what they found was that even if you didn't get maintenance, about 20% of patients were still out at eight years without progression, but if you got this abbreviated maintenance, 40% of patients were still out at eight years not having progressed. That's doing pretty well without chemotherapy. And the overall survival in the update was pretty good, about 65% for the standard and about 75% for those who got abbreviated maintenance therapy. The RESORT trial also gives us some baseline data as to what one might expect with rituximab. This was four weekly doses and then indefinite maintenance until an event or retreatment upon progression. And there are problems with this analysis, but time to treatment failure didn't matter whether you got the induction only in retreatment or continued maintenance, but this just shows you these curves are not that dissimilar from what we were seeing with some of the chemotherapy curves. And if you look at time to cytotoxic therapy, some of these patients didn't require cytotoxic therapy for a long, long time with just getting rituximab. The toxicities, no grade five, virtually no grade four toxicities in either of these arms in comparison to what you get with chemoimmunotherapy. Now, in about 2004 in the CALGB, we started this concept of biological doublets. And we didn't have many toys to play with at the time, so we did rituximab and the anti-CD80 galixamab. And in low flippy, we had a 92% response rate with 75% of patients getting complete remissions. Even in intermediate, it was 80 and 50. The progression-free survival for those in low flippy, 80% were out of five years and longer. I still haven't seen a patient relapse from this in low flippy. And even with intermediate flippy, they're doing rather well. And these are curves comparable to those one might see with chemotherapy. And if you look at the overall survival, it was 90 plus percent at a median of four and a half years. Well, the next one we did was with the anti-CD22 epratuzumab. And we got a response rate of about 90% with rituximab, epratuzumab, and no chemotherapy up front. And again, progression-free survival, 90 plus percent for the low flippies and very good for the intermediate flippies. And some of the high flippies didn't do so badly either. And the survival curves, again, 90, 95% survival without chemotherapy. And very well tolerated, just a couple of antibodies. None of the chemotherapy effects. 
There are some other interesting drugs out there for doublets that came along. There's lenalidomide, which in large cell lymphoma has little activity in mantle cell and transform, but in follicular, about 40% of patients will have a response, including 11% complete remissions. In vitro, there are data that suggest that adding rituximab to lenalidomide improves the outcome of critters. Here's len, here's rituximab, and here's the combination, and the survival is longer with the combination compared to buffer, len, or rituximab alone, which led to the idea that maybe if you put the two of these together, len and rituximab, so-called R squared as we called it, you'd get a good outcome. So we conducted a study, uh, which hopefully is in press in JCO, we're told it is, uh, of R squared versus lenalidomide. We had a third arm of rituximab alone. We jettisoned that because it hampered accrual. And in the relapse setting, we had a 73% response rate with the doublet versus 50 with len alone. And the median event-free survival and two-year event-free survival were about twice as long with the combination doublet versus the single agent len. So the next thing we did was to say, oh yes, Martin, I've heard of him. What's to say, <laughs> what's to say, what if we looked at this regimen up front and we did lenalidomide 20 milligrams days one through 21 with a possible escalation and some rituximab. And it was well tolerated. Hematologically, almost everything we saw was grade one to two, very little grade three toxicity. And in the non-heme adverse events, the same thing. Virtually everything was grade one and two. So it's a very well tolerated regimen. What about the activity of this? Well, it was rather impressive. Overall, 96% of patients responded with at least 71% CR, there were four patients who were PET negative but didn't have a follow-up bone marrow. So at least 71%. But if you look at the low flippies, 100% responded, 75% complete remission. That's better than you get with BR. And this is a real cooperative group. <laughs> uh, Progression-free survival, almost 90%. My former fellow, Nathan Fowler, repeated this experiment in MD Anderson. I won't go into the differences, the subtle differences between how the doses and schedules ran because of time. But if you look at the toxicities, almost everything was grade one to two hematologic, a little grade three neutropenia, and the other toxicities, almost all grade one and two for the non-heme toxicities. And if you look at the follicular lymphoma only response rates, 98% response rate, 87% of which are complete remissions. This is without chemotherapy. Upfront, R squared, I have no idea how to fix this. It's telling me to shut up, I've reached my storage space. Yes, I'm sure. No, I'm not sure. Hit the damn button. Thank you. Okay, and it, it, it must be, oh, there we go. And if you look at the progression-free survival for follicular, the median is not reached out at three and a half years, and it's a, over 80%. It's not quite as good with marginal zones or SLLs, but we're focusing on the folliculars. And if you look at the overall survival, it's 96% at three years. This isn't chemotherapy. These aren't suffering through the hair loss, the rashes, the neuropathy of all your dreaded chemotherapy agents, Dr. Martin. And if you look at a doublet, this was a study presented at ASH by Aoife Kimby, R squared versus rituximab up front in follicular lymphoma. You can see they got an 81% response rate with about 40% complete remissions, which was better than what was seen with rituximab alone. So doublet therapy is effective. And this led to the relevance trial, which was a thousand patient study completed a few months ago comparing R squared 
versus our chemo, which could be our CHOP, our CVP, or our bendamustine. The results of this study could change the way we approach follicular lymphoma in the upfront setting, and I project that they will for purposes of the debate. But we now have lots of other toys here. Uh, the t in the gray are those that deal with the, uh, the cell surface. These are the ones with all the intracellular pathways, and these are drugs which impact the microenvironment. We have lots and lots of new toys which are more effective. Most of them are relatively non-toxic and can be combined with rituximab with each other. And in fact, in CLGB, we're doing a treblet of R squared plus a brutinib. So we can build on doubles and go to triples. The issue is we have these drugs and we have these targets and we need doublets or more because, you know, oh yeah, we can knock off PI3K or we can knock off BTK or we can knock off BCL2 or whatever, but the cell is smart. The lymphoma cell is smart. And it's an intricate pathway of lots and lots of things going here and there. You knock one off, it'll do something else. So you need to have more than one drug there. But I did an analysis this morning. Just based on the table I showed you and just using drugs not of the same class, if you want doublets just from that table, there are 36 potential combinations. And if you have treblets, 84 potential combinations. If you want to look at the permutations, it's 72 and 504, which can keep clinical trialists going on forever, trying to find the best of these regimens. But we have great drugs, and they are available for doublets and for treblets in clinical trials and eventually for clinical use. So the goal should be to eliminate chemotherapy. Rituximab and doublets are reasonable for initial treatment, but the doublets clearly seem to be superior. Their activity is at least comparable to chemoimmunotherapy and much more tolerable than chemoimmunotherapy, and the relevance trial will help to eliminate chemotherapy from the face of the lymphoma earth. Was that strong enough? So we have many new agents which are rapidly moving to the frontline setting, and they should be incorporated into doublets and triplets. It's critical to accrue patients to clinical trials to improve patient outcome, and the next time we will have this chemoimmunotherapy will be of historical interest only because chemoimmunotherapy will be dead. <laughs>